Thanks for joining us for this episode of The Agronomist, brought to you by U.S. Borax, The Wheat School, and Adama Canada. While other sources of innovation run dry, Adama is here to deliver, leveraging the world's largest library of actives to provide innovative crop protection solutions to your greatest challenges. We're all in on you. Talk to your Adama sales rep today. Hello, all. Welcome to The Agronomist. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, and uh, wonderful to see so many people in the comments sharing already uh, the wee bit of rain that they got here in Ontario, with apologies to, of course, our friends in Alberta, uh, who could really use some of that rain. But uh, you know what? So could we. So uh, looking around, seeing some some decent rainfall, but Warren Schneckenberger, I apologize. Uh, we probably got a little bit that accumulated, but uh, it seems to be rolling through now. So perhaps all hope is not lost. Uh, but to that end, it also means your host may lose internet at some point, And perhaps producer Jay will become host Jay. We'll see how it rolls. Tonight's just one of those nights. Okay, welcome here, of course. Uh, to, to <laughs> Thank you, Jay. I appreciate it. Okay, so as always, if you collect those CEU credits, head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist. Let us know you took in the show uh, and grab those CEU credits. Uh, one note also had a bit of a change in plans for next week. And uh, if anybody's got some grand ideas for topics or uh, researchers or extension staff, they would love to see on the show. Zip me an email, lsmith at realagriculture.com. And uh, Warren tells me I got 7.4 millimeters at my way. Um, I would say maybe, maybe a little shy of that. Where I am, everything tends to split and go around, but probably pretty close to that. So we'll take it. Uh, okay. Anyway, any great ideas, send them my way. Uh, I'm filling up the calendar for the summer. Tonight's discussion, and I'm so glad to see Ellen in the comments, because when I mentioned last week that we were going to talk about uh, cereal leaf diseases, she was probably the only person who got very excited. And I appreciate that, Ellen. I like your energy. All right. So to have a conversation about cereal leaf disease and their management, I've got Dr. Kelly Turkington and Ms. Holly Dirksen joining me tonight. Hello. Hello to you both. Hello. Hello. Now, big thank you to Kelly, who is a little under the weather. So that's the other thing going on tonight. So thank you, Kelly, for uh, pushing through. Um, and Holly, this is, it has been a long time since we've got to work together. So this is super exciting. I, I will have extension. It's exciting. <laughs> exactly. It is. And I will have you know that I have used some of the clips of you very heavily pregnant. Um, I know. Counting canola <laughs> flowers. People tend um, to send them to me when you use them. Yes. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I'm just, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm like that. Um, anyway, yes, we're in pa Paul's weather station. Oh, okay. If it is that close, that works. Okay. Kelly, um, let's start with where, so you're based at Lacombe. Yes. How uh, has, Lacombe. Yeah, and how are the growing conditions there? Are you in one of the better areas this year? No, unfortunately, we are fairly dry here and could certainly use some rain. Uh, the forecast for next week is hopeful, but uh, those that can change. So, so it's been a bit dry. Yes. Do they keep just putting it like seven days out and seven days out and seven days out? It's just to keep your spirits up, Kelly. I'm telling Absolutely. you. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So quick question then. Does that mean, because you're doing research, you're, you know, you're looking at things. Does that mean you have to inoculate plots and, and like water them to try and get diseases going? Uh, yes, it depends on the nature of the trial, but normally where we irrigate and inoculate, it's uh, disease screening nurseries for primarily the barley, barley breeders here in Western Canada. Mm -hmm. So it would be a Canada Brandon, U of S uh, Saskatoon, and Olds College Lacombe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, very cool. All right, and Holly, based in Manitoba, how are things there? Not a great year last year. Is Are we better? I feel like we're better than last year. We had better moisture going into seeding for sure. I think up until last week, we all needed a rain across Manitoba. And then a mm -hmm. lot of places got a rain last week. Not everywhere. So we right. still have areas like Winkler to Carmen still is waiting for a rain. And they were thunder showers. So they just, some guys, they missed entirely and or hit half their yeah. fields, not the other half. So we still have guys that are definitely could use a rain. The stuff that came soaked right in. So no one's, yep. no one's too wet. 
Yeah, well, that's for sure. So we are going to talk about cereal leaf diseases tonight. Uh, usually, of course, when we talk about disease, we need that moisture component. Um, but I'm always surprised by how little moisture is sometimes needed um, and how sometimes even just heavy dew can keep things going. And so even when we're in dry conditions, it's still something to be mindful of. And and Kelly, you have sent some really great pictures. Um, so for anyone in the comments, if you have specific uh, leaf diseases uh, you would like to talk about, Kelly probably has a slide about them, to be honest. We've got some good ones there. Um, and there's a few that I, that I definitely want to talk about. But um, Kelly, let's first sort of go with the importance of scouting and and clearly and correctly identifying what you've got in the field. Why is that so important? Oh, it, it allows the producer to get the most out of the fungicide that they're going to be using. So knowing what you have in the field uh, during the growing season certainly is key. Also having some historical knowledge regarding uh, the field itself, as well as adjacent fields, some diseases like Fusarium head blight can move from one field to another, especially immediately adjacent fields. So scouting gives you a heads up in terms of an issue that is starting to develop. And then you can look at uh, scheduling tools a little later on. So normally I say when you're out scouting for your weed spectrum, take note of what you're seeing. Uh, often if it's been a, a wetter year and it's weed on weed or barley on barley, your and a susceptible variety, I might add, you're likely to see uh, significant levels of leaf spots at that sort of uh, two to three leaf, five to six leaf stage and so on. Uh, a lot of the research suggests that that herbicide timing, especially for the fungal leaf spots like tan spot and the septoria complex and things like skull, net blotch, both forms of spot blotch, that herbicide timing is probably not the best target that you want to hit. Uh, and there's mm -hmm. some reasons for that. So mm -hmm. and I don't know if Holly, you want to discuss. Yeah, oh, we sorry, will. So, cause, yeah, I'll ask Holly. And now, uh, Holly, you in, in a past life um, certainly worked on the plant pathology side for the province. Was that often and is it still one of the challenges of, you know, trying to save that pass and seeing how many things you can throw in the tank at the same yeah. time? I think especially if you are starting to see the disease showing up at that herbicide timing, we have to think about, you know, which part of the plants are the ones that are going to provide the most yield, but also conditions could change. So definitely be scouting, looking at the plants when you're looking at for your weed spectrum, but it's also about going back and thinking, okay, it was on the lower leaves. Is it moving up the plant? Cause that's what's going to be a concern. And so if you're seeing it move up in the canopy, that's when you really start to think, need to start thinking about that flag leaf timing and applying a fungicide. Mm -hmm. So Peter Johnson has entered the chat. Nice to talk to you again, Peter. We just spoke <laughs> earlier today. Um, but it, Peter suggests that perhaps Ontario gets more septoria and Western Canadian agriculture more tan spot. Do we do we agree or disagree, team? Kelly, do you think, I know we treat uh, it as sort of a complex, but do you think yeah, we have one more that, than the other? That's a good question. I would say in some of the wetter regions of the, of the prairies, the septoria complex tends to be more predominant. And the reason for that is it, it's the nature of the fungus. It produces these fruiting bodies on lesions, which ooze uh, pycnidiospores. It's sort of a mass of spores and it's dispersed by rain droplets. So you need more frequent rainfall to facilitate septoria development. In contrast, tan spot is a dry spore. It looks like a little cigar on, on a stalk on that uh, tan spot lesion and it's wind dispersed. So you don't need that, uh, the extent of splashing rain and you, you touched on heavy dews. Uh, so that can certainly facilitate it. And certainly also the rusts are, are ones that are dry spores and and mm -hmm. they can respond to to heavy dews and so on and the same with powdery mildew which fortunately tends to be less of an issue for us here in the prairie region versus let's say central canada or the maritimes holly i have seen though powdery mildew in manitoba and <laughs> really nasty and this is this might even predate your time but maybe not where it was really really bad so is it still one that we're actually controlling for or is it it's there but never really gets to be a huge issue again like i've gotten one or two questions on powdery mildew this year and they mostly came from alberta 
but um, I don't know if it's our, our varieties maybe are doing a little bit better job with powdery mildew mm. now that could be playing into it. And then whether just it's been a shift in weather patterns that we mm -hmm. aren't seeing it as much as well. Like I do wonder with Pete's question, if because Septoria thrives in a wetter environment, that's just why that's what you see in Ontario. Doesn't mean the tan spot's not there, but that Septoria is yeah. so much more prevalent that you kind of lose sight of the tan spot. My challenge to Kelly is, does it matter if you know whether it's tan spot or septoria? Ah, good question. You know, I, I, I'm gonna reference uh, some very experienced and uh, distinguished colleagues that mentored me when I was a younger pathologist, and that was Jeannie Gilbert. I probably maybe remember Jeannie, mm -hmm. and Miriam Fernandez, and their weed leaf mm -hmm. spot pathogens. And their comment was to actually, to fully identify what leaf spot you have unless the symptoms are very, very distinct. So in the case of septoria and the pycnidia that got the lesion, you typically need to take those leaf samples and do a, a lab test. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have leaf spots and the leaf spot complex, they're all going to compromise that plant's ability to photosynthesize and to fill grain and so on. So yeah, I don't think it, I should, I should back up. In wheat, we don't necessarily have great information in terms of leaf spot resistance. If you So right now, it's right. sort of a combination of things. If you mm. look at barley, and especially here in the prairies, producers have access to ratings for, tans or for spot blotch, for scald, for both forms of net blotch. So they can choose a variety with a better disease resistance package. It's a bit more difficult in terms of tan spot and septorian wheat, uh, we've got some really good information relating to uh, the rusts in wheat though. So you can mm -hmm. choose a variety with a moderately mm -hmm. resistant uh, reaction or a resistant reaction. And I think so, the fungicides, it's also similar, yeah. like tan spot and septoria. If yeah. you're selecting a fungicide to manage one of them, you're going to manage both of them. Mm -hmm. Um, I love that you've both already hit on the variety piece of this because that, of course, is a huge part of this. But so is rotation. And Kelly, you did already mention if we're going weed on weed or barley on barley. And and Pete throws out, OK, so what about, let's say, wheat after barley or after oats or just another cereal? So how specific when we're talking about some of these diseases, how specific does it need to be as far as the cereal? For most of the leaf spots, they tend to to be more of an issue in the crop that they're they're typically associated with. So things like tan spot and septoria and wheat, scald, net blotch, and spot blotch and barley. Um, it's fusarium head like this, the big one, that they're all, all the cereals are hosts. So that's something that can uh, carry over. The other one, the other diseases that we often overlook are the root rots. And I would say growing wheat after barley is worse in terms of take all versus barley after wheat. Barley doesn't seem to be as affected. And, you know, as a young scientist here in Alberta in the mid nineties, I would go out with people like Bill Chapman and John Palatke with Alberta Ag in that sort of Edmonton, Barhead, Westlock area. And the amount of ta uh, take all that I, that we saw was quite, quite significant. It hasn't really been as much of an issue. And I, you know, the things that I think about are perhaps better copper fertility, that we're applying copper more consistently and copper can have an impact on, on risk. And also rotation with canola. If we look at some of the work out of Australia, some of these brassica crops actually uh, have a biofumigant capacity and may actually help to limit take all risk too. But certainly barley on wheat, less of a concern uh, for take all. Wheat and barley, a bit more of a concern. And then common root rot can attack both, but in general, it tends to be more severe with barley on barley versus uh, barley on wheat or, or vice versa. So now, uh, Holly, you're of course in an area where fusarium is, is essentially a given uh, mm -hmm. most years in the wheat crop. So so similar, so same question to you, basically, in that when you're looking at a rotation and, and determining risk levels for some of these diseases, is it, you know, same idea, is a cereal following a cereal, is it the biggest concern of fusarium anyway, so we'll work with what else we've got? Yeah, I would say that's the fusarium, because like Kelly said, a lot of those leaf spot pathogens or the rust or whatever they may be will rust blow in anyway. So the ones that are carrying over year to year are specific to the crop um sometimes the other thing we talk about 
with winter wheat, because we do have some winter wheat acres in Manitoba, is to watch for that green bridge. So I know we've been right. talking about the fungal pathogens, but we do have some viral pathogens that you really need to break that green bridge to make sure that you're not going to get an issue with that uh, in your spring mm -hmm. wheat crop. Holly, you've brought up viruses. I'm also going to ask about bacterial leaf spot, I think, or bacterial, what's bacterial it called? Bacterial blight. I mean, depends yeah, on the crop. Bacteria, right? <laughs> because Jeremy Boyce and I were talking about this today, and I'm like, guys, now we're going to have to deal with viruses and bacteria? <laughs> Keep it simple, pathologists. Keep it simple. Okay, we will tackle that um, because it is important to know the difference. And as Jason Vogt, Vogt points out, nerds like Holly, so Holly, you can punch him next time, uh, <laughs> need to properly identify these things because, of course, uh, even though most fungicides work on all of them, we need to identify them. But we do when we're talking about the difference between exactly that, viral pathogens, bacterial pathogens, um, yeah. and those sorts of things. So, yes, it is important, and we have lots of cool pictures that we are going to get to so but before we do that um and i'm trying very hard to get both clips in tonight i want to uh before we shift gears just a little bit i want to run this first clip uh, that talks about identifying the flag leaf because of course when we're talking about leaf disease yes we want nice clean window panes to absorb all that sunlight but really it's about protecting that flag leaf that contributes to yield so jay if you would uh run the clip we're at that time where we have to start making the final decisions and we really need to make sure we know when we're at flag leaf stage because keeping that flag leaf clean and making as much wheat yield as possible is critical. So how do we do that? It's actually pretty simple. We just take one of the main stems out of the wheat canopy and we start crushing the stem. We're so fortunate that wheat stems are hollow, but we just crush up that stem. We find the first node. So we know already we're at growth stage 31, first node. Then we crush above that first node, the stem's still hollow. We crush up and we find, ah, there's the second node. So now we're at growth stage 32. So how do we know if this is the flag leaf or not the flag leaf? It's quite simple. We just follow that leaf down to the first node. Find out which leaf, the leaf sheath, actually comes down to that first node. So that is the leaf that comes down to the first node. The leaf sheath is attached at the node. That is leaf number four. So if that's leaf number four, that's leaf number three. This one's the penultimate leaf. And man, if we're at growth stage 32, the penultimate leaf coming out like this and we're waiting for that last nitrogen application, that's the time, because I don't want to burn that penultimate leaf. It's sticking straight up. If you're using dry, it's not such a big concern, but man, it, if we burn the penultimate with 28% with that last application, because we're trying to time for yield and not have too lush a canopy, now is the time to go. Plus, the next leaf will be the flag leaf. So now, as soon as we see the flag leaf, we're okay here, we don't see the flag leaf. As soon as we see the flag leaf, no more weed control. It's too high a risk, it's revenge spraying. Even now it's probably revenge spraying, but many growers being held out of the, the field because of low night temperatures still wanna get out there, still wanna do that job. If you haven't got a fungicide on yet and you're planning on a two fungicide program, Mostly, I'm not sure we need two fungicides, so you need to scout. Look for the powdery mildew, look down in the canopy, go to the protected areas of the field, go to the overplants, the double planted areas of the field, look in the lushest areas. Varieties, quite a difference in powdery mildew with varieties this year. Some, a lot, are staying quite clean. Certain varieties really seem to be susceptible. If you have powdery mildew, if you have septoria, then we want to keep that penultimate, that leaf number two, and the flag leaf clean. Our sponsors tonight are Adama Canada, The Wheat School, and U.S. Borax. Understanding the interplay of macro and micronutrients is important when choosing fertilizer products and agricultural practices. The ag team at U.S. Borax are experts in boron's role in soil and plant health, including how boron deficiency can limit yield even when sufficient macronutrients are applied. 
Backed by decades of field research and lab studies, we can provide recommendations tailored for your specific soil situation. Go to borax.com slash radio for more. Sorry, I'm always dancing to the tunes. Okay, uh, welcome back, everybody. I'm your host, Lindsay Smith. I've got Kelly Trickington and Holly Dirksen here. Let's start now. So, Peter Johnson, I don't know what year that one was from. It was only a couple of years ago, based on your hair. Um, but you know, yes, we're talking about fungicide timing, um, or we're talking about end timing that video, but also protecting that fly leaf. So, Kelly, how important are those top two leaves? So, the flag and the penultimate. Uh, in wheat, very important, and the head tissue itself can, can certainly contribute to yield. In barley, it's a bit of a different story. The penultimate in many varieties tends to be somewhat smaller, and really it's the penultimate and the third leaf down from the head, the flag leaf sheath, and then the head tissue itself. So those are the key, uh, key leaves uh, in terms of grain filling and yield, and the ones that you want to directly target with fungicide, especially if you're starting to see uh, development of the leaf spot disease is lower in the canopy. They're moving into the middle part of the canopy and they're going to be threatening that upper part of the canopy. So now, Holly, when we know with our fungicides, we're, they're not curative, right? We're protecting. Um, and so how much of a window of time do we have to protect that flag leaf as far as if conditions are ripe for disease? How early is too early and how late is too late? Well, you want the flag leaf out because <laughs> you want to be protecting. We know that yeah. our, you know, even a fungicide that's systemic, it's not going to move enough in the plant. So you want your flag leaf out so that you're able to get good coverage on it for that protectant. Um, that penultimate obviously is playing a role too. So you're going to be protecting both when you're making that pass. But it's going to depend on the season. Some years we're going to move pretty quickly through the stages. And before you know it, you're at your FHB timing. So that's a lot of the balance that the growers are trying to figure out. Am I only a week away from my fusarium headlight timing? Then, you know, how much is going to happen in that week? Well, what is the weather forecast? Can I just wait for that fusarium timing? Because with those fusarium fungicides, you're going to get protection on your flag leaf as well. Right. So Kelly, for for which diseases do you think it makes the most difference? Which ones move the fastest, let's say, that you maybe wouldn't want to wait? <clears throat> uh, most most of the uh, leaf spot diseases can complete their life cycle in about seven days. The exception is scald and barley, and that usually takes about 11 to 14 days in terms of cycling. But uh, I would say uh, the nice thing about cereals, and I came from more of a canola and stem rot background, is the fact that you can follow disease development in the field and you let that tell you uh, the stage that you need to put the fungicide on, on and so on. And if you're starting to see uh, stripe rust, for instance, or leaf rust or powdery mildew earlier on during the tail end of the herbicide timing into tillering into stem elongation, you may actually need to put a fungicide on at that point in time. And, and the reason why it's more effective for those particular diseases is the pathogens that cause them are all biotrophic. So they don't kill the plant tissue initially. Once you get severe symptoms, though, the, t the plant just can't keep up with the, the rust pathogen. So the normal pathways in terms of the way fungicides will penetrate if they're, if they're maybe moving with the water transpiration stream, the xylem tissue, they have a better ability to actually get into where that rust pathogen or that powdery mildew pathogen is to give you potentially eradication. The leaf spots in contrast, like tan spots, septoria, scald, net blotch, spot blotch, are all necrotrophic pathogens. So they kill the host tissue and then feed on the cell contents that are leaking mm. out. So. Uh, once you see symptoms that are about a week to 10 days old, it's too late to get eradication in terms right. of tan spot or septoria or these other leaf spots. Different okay. story with rust and powdery mildew. Okay. Um, that's, that's gross. Anyway, <laughs> eating the stuff that leaks out. All right. Uh, we've got goat farmer. Goat, yeah, goat farmer joining us from the Philippines. We're originally from Saskatchewan, Alberta. And uh, he and Jason both have a similar question. So 
We want to capture the flag, the penultimate, especially in wheat. They contribute the most. Does it mean we just ignore the lower leaves? Like what about how important are the mid to low? And that would be a much earlier timing. Now, I feel like when wheat prices were through the roof, maybe that's an easier decision. But Holly, I'll start with you. Do we ignore them entirely and just target the it top? It would team? have to be a very severe infection at an early timing for me to recommend going in earlier than your flag leaf timing. So in my experience, I have never seen an infection like that. The times when I see a very severe infection, and I know you're going to loop back to bacteria, but like yeah. bacterial blight and oats, that'll be like something that'll be like, this is showing up early. What do I do? How can I control? Well, yeah. a fungicide's not going to happen with happen or help with the bacteria. No. So, in my experience, I have never seen a fungicide provide a yield benefit when you apply it exactly. earlier than flag leaf. Okay, Kelly. Now Alberta's drier, but generally speaking. I, uh, I would say, you know, we've had a, a number of trials over the last 20 years and where we see, as Holly's already alluded to, severe development of disease starting early. If we delay our fungicide application to post head emergence, so we're thinking, well, we'll just spray once, we'll get some mm -hmm. FHB suppression, dawn suppression, leaf spot control or rust control, you're going to compromise your yield and grain filling. So if you're seeing significant levels of leaf spotting diseases at the tail end of that herbicide timing, moving into tillering stem elongation, you might want to think about an application around uh, the, to the penultimate leaf. So even before the flag leaf stage, but I would be cautious going any earlier than that as Holly's already, already said. But if you're seeing that, typically it would be wheat on wheat or barley on barley you're probably looking at a need to put on a couple applications, one prior to head emergence and probably around penultimate leaf emergence, and then again, post head emergence. And I think it would be stars aligning. Like I think it, like Kelly said, the rotation would be wheat on wheat, barley on barley. It would be high moisture, high humidity, and maybe a variety that's not as, as tolerant to the disease or resistant to the disease. Okay. So quite a few questions earlier on and coming in about rust so let's maybe start there so i think at slide seven producer jay i think um and you know maybe we have to go back one or forward one i jotted these notes down very quickly um but a couple questions about okay so i'm just going to put it out there i'm no plant pathologist we all know that how am i supposed to tell the difference between stem rust and leaf rust from that picture one looks more orange, Kelly. How am I supposed to know? You're, you've hit the, the key thing. So striped rust tends to have a more of a yellowy orange color, and you'll see longer uh, sort of stripes of that on, okay. on the leaf tissue itself. Leaf rust tends to be more of a reddish brick color, and of course you can see what appear to be a bit of stripes, but normally that's not a typical uh, uh, sort of symptom. And in stem rust, as the name implies, you do get a lot of stem infection uh, in addition to leaf infection. So um, the leaf rust and the stem rust tend to be an issue more for the central to eastern uh, prairie regions and of course potentially into central Canada and the Maritimes. Uh, in Alberta, stripe rust tends to be our uh, main issue and it reflects where the rusts are coming from. So the Pacific Northwest is our source for the central to western prairie region for stripe rust. That Texas to Nebraska corridor tends to be our source for uh, uh, leaf rust, potentially stem rust, but we don't necessarily see a lot of stem rust. And unfortunately, more and more over the last 10 to 15 years, we see more stripe rust development in Kansas, in Nebraska, and so on. All right, so rust is one of the ones, of course, rotation's not going to help it. Um, residue management, none of those things, because of course it blows in. But Holly, do we have ones that overwinter, or do some of these sometimes overwinter, or is it just on wind? <laughs> the stripe rust has been known to overwinter, <gasps> often in Alberta. Way to go, Alberta. Oh, <laughs> Alberta. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, I mean, in, in wheat, I think that's the only one. And then oat, oat crown rust, yeah. I believe can overwinter here, right? We have the alternate host for it here. So that so, would be the other yeah. one. But we're still, even with the ones that are overwintering, we're watching those rust reports from the U.S. because that is where the majority of spores are going to blow in from. Rusts are my favorite. I love this picture, Kelly. Good job. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
So um, I don't love them, I'll be honest. Now, but I mean, Pete's got a good question here. I know here in Ontario, certainly in the oat crop, uh, there's a lot of susceptibility to rusts here. And uh, there's a lot of sort of oat pea forage mixture or cover crop oat that can end up just covered in this stuff. Is it the same pathogen? Like are the striped rust in Alberta, is that the same one that would happen in say Eastern Ontario? Same thing for leaf, like, I'm assuming there are a couple different species or strains of these things, but for the most part, are they host specific or totally like, hey, we love everybody? They they, they tend to be very host specific. Uh, mm -hmm. The the issue may be that particular pathotypes might be different in that mm -hmm. sort of Texas to Nebraska corridor or the Pacific Northwest. Uh, one of the issues with the Pacific Northwest is that uh, we have the alternate host for stem rust and, and some of the recent research out of, out of the U.S. Uh, and Northwestern U.S., the Pacific Northwest, suggests that it is probably, uh, could be considered our center of diversity for stem rust. So I'm a little worried about that area yeah. of the U.S. potentially being a source for stem rust. But the, the biggest things would be the pathotype and that would reflect the particular varieties that were being grown and the particular disease resistance packages that the breeders have incorporated into those varieties. So are each of these as pathogenic, let's say, or, and, and Ellen and Peter, thank you for sharing in the, in the comments as well. So, so Ellen Sperry uh, saying that she's the year that Peter's referring to um, in winter wheat where stripe rust, if you did not control it, uh, was really just awful and took out the winter wheat crop. Um, Ellen suspects that it overwintered in the trials at Concordia that year, um, and because it was there shortly after green up. So, so I guess that's my that's my question. Are we most worried about stripe rust, or is stripe rust the most uh, destructive simply because it can overwinter or does show up earliest, or are some of them a much larger worry than the others? Kelly, maybe I'll start with you. Yeah, and I, I think it depends on, on the particular variety and the disease resistance package. So if it's a, a susceptible variety and you have the rust moving in well before flag leaf emergence, and there's work out of the Australia that looks at yield loss, once you get past into the grain filling period, even though you do get it, you can get some significant rust development, the yield loss tends to start to decline. It doesn't disappear, uh, certainly, but certainly as, as some of the commenters have said, and Peter, that if it gets established early, you can see some catastrophic yield losses. And, and mm -hmm. like the comments from Ellen and others, we have seen striped rust over winter here in central Alberta. And 2015, I think, was a year where we had striped rust active on winter wheat in mid-April. And wow. so, and some of the other work my colleagues have done uh, is that if you have spring wheat and it's a susceptible variety adjacent to these winter wheat fields that have a lot of stripe rust developing and where it's overwintered, you better mm -hmm. be on your toes as far as scouting and then getting in there as soon as you start to see roughly the rule of thumb from Dr. Chen in Washington State. It's about 5% leaf infection. So 5% of the leaves infection or 5% of the area of the canopy affected would be sort of a threshold for, threshold. for, for, for straight rust. Uh, Holly, how do, how do we do for products? Now, Kelly, you've sort of alluded to that rust is one that we can get a good handle on. So are we in, a, are we in good shape as far as fungicides go for rust if we get in there early? Yeah, I think a lot of fungicides um, have good activity on them. It's... You know, it's about scouting and looking for those pustules and making sure you're getting in there at the correct timing uh, more so because, you know, the, the fungicides aren't going to last forever. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you have to make sure yeah. that you're timing it along with when the infection is showing up. The other thing is, is they do, the different rusts do have slightly different environments that they favor. So the stripe rusts like it a little bit cooler, which is maybe counterintuitive as to why it would be an issue in Ontario, but that's why it infects early. So that's why... Mm -hmm. A little bit of a scarier rust because an earlier infection obviously can have a bigger impact on the plant and then the leaf rust and stem rust like it warmer but that lines up perfectly typically to when they blow in in the season anyway <laughs> so it's not like we ever can escape them it's all about when those spores are blowing in or whether it's overwintering in the case of stripe, stripe rust Do you have a oh go ahead kelly 
I was just going to say, Holly, a great point. And Starburst traditionally is a, a more of a cooler season uh, issue, perhaps in that 15 to 20. But over the last, what about probably 10 to 20 years, we've seen the emergence of high temperature strains of striped rust mm -hmm. that can develop at much higher temperatures. And so that's probably the reason why we're seeing more of it in that Texas to Nebraska corridor. Hmm. Darn Mother Nature adapting and stuff. Um, okay, Jason wants to circle back to the one question, and this is excellent. Uh, this is what I love about a live chat where we can go back and ask the question again. So when we talked about that mid canopy to lower canopy protection of those leaves, um, Jason's question was more along the lines of, if you're going off to protect the penultimate, the flag leaf, should you be on your spray pass focused on getting product down past that deeper into the canopy for better coverage of those lower leaves or does that really not have the impact that maybe is worth the extra effort who Can't wants hurt. to take that one yeah <laughs> I'll I like that. more is better yeah i just okay. uh, it, you know it's about water volume so for fungicides i i like a high water volume mm -hmm. always so I, it yeah. certainly can't help to penetrate the canopy and, and get as much protection out of that product as, I mean, you're, you know, it's not a free product. You're putting your dollars down. So you might as well be trying to get the, the most out of it. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and there would definitely be benefit. It, you know, if you're getting that chemical down below, let's say the penultimate leaf or the third leaf from the head and that, that leaf tissue is still reasonably healthy, that fungicide will help to limit further development on the disease. Uh, on that crop, protecting it as the crop is moving into that grain filling period. So yeah, and, and especially if you're seeing a significant amount of disease earlier on, then getting it into that crop canopy would be very important too. But coverage is, and water yeah. volumes, yeah. My guess is that's the answer Jason wanted because he's been trying to convince right. his growers to, to use more water. <laughs> yeah, let's at least put it this way, don't cut back the water, okay? Yeah. So maybe you're not gonna do extra, but this is a reason not to cut it back. Jason, yeah. I hope that's what you needed. There you go. Don't cut your water uh, <laughs> water volumes back. Okay, I think it is slide number 14 that I want. I think it's like the five horsemen of the wheat apocalypse or barley apocalypse, something like that, um, which you're right, producer Jay. Uh, hats off to Kelly for naming some of these slides. They're really quite great. Um, I think it's 14, Jay. I'm not sure. It's got, uh, we'll find something. We'll just keep going. I wrote down very quick notes. So is it this one? Yeah, the four and then there's five, but let's start here. Okay, so we've talked about the rusts a little bit, um, but, and we've talked a bit about Septoria and Town Spot. So this is one of the things I wanted to sort of carry this forward um, beyond potentially just, you know, eating away at leaf tissue and impacting yield. I wanted to talk about, you know, sometimes symptoms or things we see on the head and so yes we'll talk about fusarium head blight which no it's not a leaf disease but that's okay um, but how much do we have to worry about these diseases potentially moving to uh the head and impacting actual quality beyond fusarium head blight although we could talk about that too definitely uh, you know if you look at tan spot it's uh, the the pathogen that causes tan spot also causes red smudge and durum wheat so you'll get downgrading due to pinkish reddish discoloration of the the durum kernel due to the tan spot pathogen and the same thing with the septoria complex especially septoria nodorum uh, or parastagnosper nodorum as the taxonomists call it now and they're always changing that and you can get gloom blotch symptoms, but the infection can then progress to the seed itself. And it produces symptoms that mimic fusarium damage mm -hmm. kernels, actually. Mm -hmm. So from this image, you know, maybe not as similar, but in the field, you don't have perfect images side by side to compare them to. So I could yeah. certainly see where, um, yeah, Holly, I guess that's my question to you is that when you're scouting so for pathologists like the two of you who are you know seeing these things all the time and comparing them all the time um maybe it's clear but what how important is it to get some of these like images side by side and really dig into what it could be beyond what you think it is so yeah we already talked a little bit about the like the leaf spots like tan spot and septoria about you're seeing it you'd manage it the same way i would say for the rust it's a little more important especially with things like bridal selection, but also 
for reporting purposes. <laughs> like we all like to know what's blowing in, you know, what the mm -hmm. patterns are, if patterns are changing year to year, that's where the scientists at Ag Canada, you know, is really valuable data for them. Um, so that one, I'd say it's fairly important to make sure that you're properly IDing or calling out your agronomist to, to help you through that. So um, different reasons, but also for, you know, future choices for variety selection, you know, for your notes, you want to make sure that you're capturing what happened this year, what worked and what didn't with based on what showed up so that in future years, you can maybe alter your, your decisions. So, and that's, I mean, to both of you in, and perhaps even those in the comments, and I know Ellen's here and Peter loves to go over the, go over the variety selection and all that, you know, there's lots of things that we screen for and those sorts of things, but how quickly do we make progress on some of this, Kelly? In, in you know, our, I know that we don't swap out our wheat varieties as quickly as maybe most people would like us to sometimes, but you know, how important is it to, uh, to be updating every once in a while for better resistance? Well, certainly on the rust side of things, uh, the group in Morden with Ag Canada and other groups at the U of S in Saskatoon, Ag Canada and Lethbridge, and even UBC and NBC, uh, monitor the pathotypes of rust. So they identify the pathotypes, sort of the, the nature of the rust pathogens, and they can identify whether we have new pathotypes that can overcome the resistance in current varieties. So that sends a signal to the pathologist and then to the breeder that, hey, we've got a shift in the rust pathogen population. We need to look at changing the resistance sources uh, that we have. So, you know, that's an ongoing activity. It may be somewhat, you know, five to 10 years is often what you hear from breeders in terms of shifting things. Uh, it can be longer if we don't have good sources of resistance that are easily mm -hmm. crossed into our adapted varieties. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Ellen says, I agree with Holly. Rust is cool, but also evil. Um, <laughs> so there you go. Okay, we're just going to do a quick throw, our last throw to our sponsor of tonight's show. And then when we get back, Ellen's actually asked a great question about bacterial leaf streak. So I have promised we will talk about it. So we'll talk about that and some viruses as well. Thank you to each of our sponsors tonight, Adama Canada, US Borax, and The Wheat School. From variety advancements, protein and yield management, precision farming, and to marketing, Real Agriculture's Wheat School is a video series that tackles every facet of the wheat growing season in an engaging and informative format. The Wheat School is made possible through Syngenta Canada, CNM Seeds, and the Alberta Wheat Commission. Learn more at wheatschool.com. Anyway, I dig the, I dig the music. Okay. Holly, I'll start with you. What the heck? Bacterial. And Kelly, I didn't, I wrote it down, but I think you've got a slide maybe with bacterial. Uh, I think so. Maybe, I yeah. think so, if you can find that. But Holly, so you mentioned having seen it early and that's what it was. So explain to us, riddle me this. What the heck is this bacterial stuff? What's it doing in our cereal <laughs> crop? And should we be worried? Is this, it sounds scary. So... In Manitoba, we typically see bacterial blight in oats, like always. People are sending me pictures of their technicolor oats early in the season, and that is almost always what it is, is bacterial blight. And it's usually right after a rainfall. There was moisture. They maybe even had a herbicide application and kind of spread it around. Mm. Typically, it depends on the weather, but it does grow through it usually, especially if the weather turns a bit drier or less humid. Um, bacterial leaf streak, I am less familiar with. My main issue with these bacterial diseases in cereals is that when they get misidentified as a fungal disease and a fungicide is applied, <laughs> because it makes it like, worse. you need to stop this. Yes. And well, yeah. sometimes it's that pass across the field that's spreading it more, but also it's just, that's not doing anything. You're just wasting no. your money because you didn't yeah. correctly identify the disease. So Kelly, so this is, this is helpful. We've got the viruses on here. Mm. How, what about our bacterial? So there's the leaf uh, freak and the, how do we identify it? How do we tell the difference between bacterial and fungal? There's a few key things that you can focus on. First of all, is the water soaking that you'll see in long streaks, whether it's on the first true leaf, if there's seed to seedling transmission of the, the bacterium, Right. or later on as you have further development. So that long water soaked lesion. The other thing is that if it's damp, 
that uh, bacterial population will multiply and you get droplets of bacterial ooze on the surface of that infected leaf tissue or head tissue. So that's pretty diagnostic. And if you run your leaf along that, or your fingers along that leaf or the head, it's extremely slippery and greasy. So that's a very good uh, uh, diagnostic. And eventually once the plant tissue is, is killed, you'll see that sort of tan colored long streaks, but often you will see that water soaking uh, mm -hmm. of less mature infections and then the bacterial ooze. So uh, and th this is seed borne, correct? Currently, our, our, our main concern is seed borne infection. And, but bacterial leaf streak has been more of a problem in the northern Great Plains since about 2007. So North Dakota, Minnesota, mm -hmm. South Dakota. And so there, it's maybe something that's a bit more established. And as a consequence, crop residues may also contribute to bacterial leaf streak epidemics. But if, if you look at the situation in Alberta, uh, if you talk to people like Mark Harding or myself, we're concerned about seed borne infection being a source of bacterial leaf streak right. that develops in that field. And that's facilitated typically by lots of irrigation and severe weather events. So driving rain, right. strong winds, hail, and so on. Okay. Um, it sounds terrifying. Do we have, are there, are there any seed treatments or is it, if we know we've got it, find new seed supply? Oh, that's the million dollar question right now. And, and it's something that I think the seed testing labs are, are struggling with in terms of advising their clients. So what is it, what is a safe source of seed to use? And mm -hmm. certainly the higher the level of infection, the greater the risk in terms of seed to seedling transmission and then further development. Uh, within that crop. But unfortunately, we don't have good tools. We don't have seed treatments. Uh, the work that's come out of places like Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, it's not overly encouraging in terms of foliar products. Often they're copper based and uh, they're not seeing really consistent and good control of it. Part of that actually may be that they're, they're in the few fungal leaf spot mentality where one application can take care of that issue for you. Yeah. It's a bit of a different story for bacterial leaf streaks. So in, in terms of using an in-crop product, let's say over the next five to 10 years, we may need to look at the idea of multiple applications on a seven to 14 day spray schedule. That's just my speculation. Mm -hmm. But as Holly mentioned, if you get it wrong and you don't know that's what you're after and you're spraying a fungicide, you actually could be making it worse. Absolutely. You're running through the field. So you do need to know what it is you're targeting. See, yeah, Jason, and, it's not just for nerds. It's for it, good it, you know, I had a good example of that in 2012. Um, and Jack Payne sent me some leaf samples uh, from Southern Alberta. And it was uh, a, a grower that had already applied fungicide three times and had no activity at all. And it was because it was bacterial yeah. leaf streak. So they wasted that input cost on a, an issue that wasn't controlled by fungicide. It probably made it worse. I mean, excellent learning for everyone who didn't have to pay <laughs> that bill. Um, okay, uh, just quickly. So on that, that's a great visual, Kelly, that we had. Um, let's touch briefly on viruses. Holly, you did mention the green bridge. So um, we've got barley yellow dwarf virus, and then we've got wheat streak mosaic. Now, are both spread by insects? Yes, let's blame the insects. Let us. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> This is important though. The viruses are carried by insects that are carried by a vector. Yes. Um, okay, so are there specific insects that carry yes. them or is it like so, the a rod with anybody? Wheat streak mosaic virus, it's the wheat curl mite. So obviously, as the name implies, the diagnostics are, it creates stripes on the plant, but it also, the edges of the leaves will curl up and that's where the wheat curl mites are hiding. So you can, you know, look for the bugs. That's kind of one of the diagnostics here. And then barley yellow dwarf is with the aphids. So then you look for right. an aphid and population. To see aphid? It's, it's, which is an oat bird cherry aphid. Oh, we've, we've talked about that aphid on here before. <laughs> Apparently that one gets around. It likes just about anything. Is so that the right one, I, Kelly, or am I crazy? I get no, 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 it's a, it's an aphid, uh, uh, 
you know, and it typically they're blown in from the states. Yeah. So uh, normally we yeah. don't see, and my perspective is from the Western Prairie, Prairie region, we don't see Barleyola dwarf typically until sometime in July, and that's the odd plant mm -hmm. here and there. Interesting. It's where you get infections occurring early, where you can get some devastating uh, yield yeah. losses, and that's typically you'd see that in the southern states, Mexico, and so on. But the um, yeah, so. But again, it's a virus. So once your crop has it, like, can it get better? Or, <laughs> or you know, like Kelly, who is controlling the aphids, and I would right? say, yeah. especially neighboring crops. Like, that's where okay, you so know it's in an area, that's when you need to be scouting for the aphids and then work on controlling the aphids. Okay. So good to know. But realistically, it's not like we can give our crop necessarily an antiviral. We can just not stop. yet, not no, yet. No. But give it time, and science will the, solve it. The other, it's right. not a viral issue; it's mycoplasma. So we often associate oh, yeah. aster yellows <laughs> with canola, right. but it can affect a wider range of crops, including the cereals. So in 2012, we had quite a significant outbreak of aster yellows, yeah, and I think I it was uh, the leafhopper population built in the states there were lots of wind trajectories that carried those leaf hoppers up into western canada so we saw a fair bit of aster yellows typically poor head filling often the head didn't come out of the boot uh, mm -hmm. sometimes a reddish pink sort of discoloration uh, so that's another issue that we see uh, alfalfa i think is an excellent host based on some of the research that tyler whist has done and colleagues at Ag canada saskatoon so but the one yeah, thing I just want to it with yeah. canola because that's the yeah. most right. It and it's like symptom, yeah. but it is, yeah. And <laughs> I do remember. I remember that year. I don't know if you do, Holly, Me but too. the next yeah. year, of course, that's like all we could talk about is like how do we, you know, because there was actually maybe a yield impact from it, which is pretty rare for Australia. Mm -hmm. And then everybody, and it was like, guess what? There's nothing you can do. Great. So <laughs> moving on. Anyway, it hasn't really happened since then. <clears> that we've had a bad year for it. So there you go. Um, okay. So uh, Pete notes about finding the aphids L ladybugs love aphids so if you look for the ladybugs they're easier to find and then follow them to the aphids um they'll say come come this way and away you go uh okay jason's got a great question just to bounce around here as we run out of time uh crown rust and oats and rust and oats definitely a big issue um so can we predict if we will get more infection from the south versus our local hosts of buckthorn we have so much of it here too Holly, what do you think? Can we predict? Or do we just... Well, I, I, I cheated and I saw Peter's response. <laughs> so, that's not cheating, that. that's all being strategic. <laughs> so I saw that he said in Ontario that definitely the local yeah, population of Buckthorn is playing a role. I don't think... Yeah. I mean, we have Buckthorn in Manitoba. I think for the most part, I'm still looking at those maps from the south to predict You know whether this is going to be an issue. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there is, is as much buckthorn neighboring our oak growing regions as maybe what we're seeing in Ontario. We have a lot yeah. of it in our fence. And, and certainly, as, as, as Holly said, you know, what's happening in the U.S. gives us an indication. And then if we look at the Prairie Crop Disease Monitoring Network, they issue weekly rust forecast, risk forecast mm -hmm. for the prairie region. If you look at trajectories coming from the U.S., the source locations for the rust, whether it's leaf rust, stripe rust, stem rust, or, or crown rust. But we also look at um, uh, the development of the disease, what's happening down south. And this year, there hasn't been a lot of rust development in that Texas to Nebraska corridor. So we don't have a huge source of it blowing into Western Canada. So maybe this is where the, the buckthorn in Ontario especially would, would be a, a definite concern. We shall blame it because it's not a very kind plant to have around so we can just point fingers at it if we want um okay so i have new nightmares now by this bacterial stuff so thanks ellen i hope that i have set your mind at ease that you have a new thing to worry about um but but maybe not i'm kidding but it is a bit scary but i i am glad to hear that um you know we need to get this message out of of properly identifying these things. So hopefully we're not going to do something like travel across the field many times. Uh, I do want to, let's just touch on while we have time. I know it's not a leaf disease, but fusarium timing as well. Um, now here in Ontario, of course, we've got 
heads emerge in glory because we've got winter wheat and Peter is a magician and has made it beautiful despite no water for the last little while. Um, just kidding. It looks okay. Um, but uh, of course, we've got mostly a spring seeded crop uh, across the prairies. And um, that is, of course, going to be the most economically damaging, uh, not just, of course, a yield robber, but a quality robber as well. So Holly, we have done these videos in the field about timing our applications. Have we gotten better at protecting that head i mean you don't have that video queued up of me heavily pregnant you while i'm what? here oh, I, darn. Yeah, no <laughs> you know i figured i'd cut you some slack once yeah anyway. uh have we gotten better at it i think so it really depends on the year and how stagey our crop is so luckily in manitoba we had pretty good moisture early in the season so i think we had decent even emergence this year so then that always helps when it comes to staging your fusarium headlight timing um I, and in manitoba too as you mentioned before we are the home of fusarium headlight so guys just spray <laughs> like it has to be a pretty dry year for them not to be making that application so i more so get that question from saskatchewan now that i you know have more colleagues that way that that ask me about timing that there mm -hmm. uh yeah, I Lindsay, I'd, I'd say, I think we are. I think uh, there is uh, increasing recognition that we can actually spray too early. So the current label window that we have, both for barley and wheat, I would say the start of it is too early. You still have a significant number of heads that are still in the boot and totally unprotected with fungicides. So you want uniform crop development, uniform head emergence, and maybe towards the middle part of the latter part of that spray window. And, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing potentially later application uh, dates uh, as we, we do more research. Because the, the fusarium, the graminiarum, can infect that head right from head emergence through to the start of senescence. Now, if the infection occurs later, more of a mycotoxin concern versus a right. fusarium damage kernel concern. I feel like That's I've been right. saying this for like 10 years, Kelly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I always tell them like, especially if it's really dry or has been dry yeah. or leading up to that early flower timing, wait. Wait a little, yeah. And if conditions change, you're not too late, you right. know, going in five days after that, so. Yeah, but, but you're right, too early and you've got tillers that haven't got heads out yet, in which case they're completely unprotected and away you go. Um, Great question, and maybe we'll end on this one, but Jason, uh, so question to both of you about, are we particularly concerned about a fungicide group being overused and resistance developing? Kelly, I'll start with you. Is there a particular uh, issue we should be, be alerted to? You know, we, we've seen some issues with uh, the triazoles and older like propiconazole. Uh, with the net blotch pathogen, more recently we're seeing some issues with spot blotch, especially isolates from Manitoba where there's a longer history of fungicide use, a longer history of spot blotch. Uh, you know, the strobulurins tend to be a higher risk uh, sort of class of fungicides, um, but the triazoles and even the SDHIs, you know, if you look at Australia, and in some cases we have similar rotations, so cereal, canola, cereal rotation, they've got resistance in net blotch, for instance, to the triazoles and SDHI chemistry. So it's really the frequency of use and both within season and between seasons. Yep. Holly, anything to add? No, I was agreeing like triazoles because of their frequency, strobies, but because of their profile. And obviously we know in other crops in Western Canada, we are seeing issues with strobe resistance. So. Okay. So make sure you need to use it and no half rates. Can we say that? Can I say that? <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Please, please. <laughs> I just, I'm from the era and Sean and I joke about this sometime. Remember when like a half rate of tilt at herbicide timing was like the thing? Please don't do that, okay? That shouldn't have been a thing. We made it a thing. It's not a thing anymore. No more half rate of tilt at herbicide timing. All right, that is our show for tonight. Uh, Dr. Kelly Trickington. 
and Ms. Holly Dirksen. Thank you for joining me on the show. Um, and thank you to all of our friends in the comments, uh, particularly Peter Johnson, who, of course, when we're talking cereals, he's got to be in there. And Ellen for being so excited about cereal leaf diseases. And I will say hello to Paisley, even though he'll never comment. Um, so there you go. All right, next week. Hey, stay tuned. I'll let you know who's going to be on and what we're going to talk about. But we will be back next week at 8 p.m. Eastern right here. So thank you to our show sponsors, The Wheat School, Adama Canada, and U.S. Borax. Uh, cheers, everybody. We'll see you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.